and looks like we are live. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Vellante. I'm a film critic for Edge Boston, and I'm also an employee at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Uh, so I am doubly honored to uh, be speaking with James Sweeney uh, today, the writer, director, and star of Straight Up, which is currently playing in the Coolidge Virtual Screening Room. Uh, it is now in its second weekend. It's a great film, um, one of the better romantic comedies I have seen in quite some time, and I would highly recommend it. Um, so James, how are you doing? How is everything going? I'm good. Uh, yeah, hanging in there. I've been social distancing for years, so, you know, it's <laughs> just sort of part of the course for me. Yeah. Um, we were talking a little bit before the call, and um, I was kind of relieved to when, upon meeting you to hear you speak because your character, Todd, in this film speaks so fast. And <laughs> it's, it's like just a constant stream of consciousness just coming out of his mouth at all times. And I was wondering while watching it, oh, how much of this is based off James? How much of yourself goes into this character when you were writing the film? Yeah, you know, I've gotten like, how much am I like Todd? I, I say it's, it's a personal film, but it's not strictly autobiographical. There's, I'd say equal parts of myself, both in Todd and Rory. I kind of see them both as like Socratic dialogue extensions of my brain. So, mm you might not like catch that because I'm playing Todd. So it seems like I'm, I'm so much of him, but you know, I think I'm, uh, you know, I think as a creator, you pull yourself out of every character. So uh, there's, you know, James and Prince all over the film, even if it's not just strictly through Todd. Cool. And in terms of that dialogue, um, it moves very fast. It's, it's very much in the style of like, mm -hmm a classic screwball, which I loved, you know, His Girl Friday is one of my favorite films and it, oh, yeah. it reminded me a lot of that. Um, was that kind of premeditated in the writing process? Did that happen during the casting um, on set when you were working with um, Kate? Yeah. It, I don't know if I, I knew immediately when I started writing it that it would be a screwball comedy. I think it kind of came through, I'm mean, backing up a little bit. My, my background is, was in playwriting before I got into screenwriting, which is inherently very dialogue focused. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm definitely a fan of the old screwball comedies and also newer ones like Gilmore Girls, obviously, or Moonlighting. So, you know, I think once I, I started writing, then it became clear that, you know, the dialogue would be a character in and of itself. And, uh, but in terms of like this, specific style of the film so much of it is based off the chemistry between Todd and Rory and I wasn't 100% sure I could cast myself until I found you know my counterpart mm -hmm. and once I found Katie uh, and realized what she could do and her range and how uh, well um, that complemented uh, what I felt like I could bring to the table and it was like really clear oh, we can really like go to the nines with with this style because um, we had done a proof of a concept called Normal Doors back mm -hmm. in 2015 that we produced for this company called Fox Digital Studios. And we ended up parting ways for creative differences. So, but that exists on, on, on Vimeo and people can go watch that. And you can see a lot of the DNA of straight up in, in Normal Doors, but I think mm -hmm. we really um, uh, sort of built upon that and really fleshed it out in the future. So when you're capturing that energy of um, the back and forth between you and Katie, um, how much do you rehearse that? Um, and how do you plan out the blocking during those scenes? Did you have a very specific, there, there are points where you're, you're whip panning back and forth. There's points mm -hmm. where you're, you're juxtaposing them in, you know, with the, with the space between them. Um, you know, what went into that when you were filming those dialogue scenes and, and how you wanted to create those visually? Yeah, well, we didn't have a lot of time for rehearsal just due to the nature of me me being the actor, writer, director, producer. So there just was limited time and she's not LA based, she's based in Vancouver. So I had gone to Vancouver a month before we started filming uh, to rehearse a little brief familiarity, I think for a couple of days. So we went over the script and um, got some of the scenes on their feet but they weren't completely off book. Uh, so, you know, we had, I didn't want like the first time that we ever act to be on set. So I wanted to, you know, have some sense of of um, trust built by that point. But then uh, when we were on set, I will say even though um, we didn't have a ton of time to rehearse, thankfully because the aesthetic is a lot of long takes and very minimal shot coverage, meaning we're not seeing, 
for people who don't know, we're not seeing like the scene from a lot of different angles. So we were able to do a lot of takes as many as we needed. Um, whereas another film might do a lot of different angles of like medium and then tighter and then tighter. Um, we didn't have that. So we were able to spend more time per scene. And I think that really let us explore the blocking. There's also a lot of stillness overall. There's not a ton of blocking, but for the scenes where there are most notably like the uh, kitchen irony scene where they're arguing about Alanis Morris that I think we spent eight hours on that scene. Yeah. So, uh, cause it's like done as a oneer, and um, you know, we definitely would try things and if they didn't work, then we'd adapt. Like the whip pans was an idea I had once I had locked in the location and the space and like, oh, we could do this and this, but some of the specific things was trial and error. Like one of my favorite bits of what I consider physical comedy is when it, it pans at her and, and she's here um, and then it pans back to me and then it pans back to her and she's already all the way over there where the glasses are. Yeah. Like that was something I'm like, oh, what if she like disappeared and like went into the background by the time you you pan back to her. Um, so that was something that wasn't pre-planned. It was something that was discovered just through the process of, of, of going through doing it over and over. Mm -hmm. um, and we just did it until we got it right or we got so bad at saying our lines out loud that we had to stop. <laughs> Well, um, if you're just joining us and, and people who have been with us, um, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to shoot them uh, through YouTube. You can also reach out on social media, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, what have you, and uh, I will be sent them as they come in, and I will be happy to ask James. Um, but uh, you mentioned Gilmore Girls earlier, and you mentioned the conversation about Alanis Morissette's Ironic, which is such a great conversation in the film. Um, there's also very poignant conversations about death and there's a really really funny rumination on we need to talk about Kevin which is one of my favorite <laughs> lines in the film how much of those are are coming from your real life conversations how much of those where did those come from because they just felt so spontaneous and off the cuff yeah I, I think most of them are are conversations I've had uh with myself <laughs> <laughs> Some of them might have been like, I might have argued. I definitely had that moment. Actually, that might have been in an improv class. The the one about uh, where they're talking about the the hills like white elephants. I think I really did think for a little while that uh, white, it was white elephant in the room and I was convinced that that's what it was. And then I had to do some, because um, I was familiar with the short story and that's why I always associated it with that. So yeah, it's usually just like music things that I've had. And then I, I make it work for the character and um, trying to fit like their perspectives and, and the banter. Um, so I, I, I keep like a, uh, it's not a diary, but like a, a cause it's on, it's digital, but I, I keep like a, a, a journal of, um, I guess, arguing ideas. <laughs> Um, in addition to the dialogue, I was really struck by the way the film captured things like anxiety and panic attacks and feeling awkward at a party and OCD and things like that. Um, where, where did that come from? And, and what did you really want to analyze about those subjects? Because I think, especially in relation to panic attacks, um, I, th I think it, the way a panic attack is captured in the film is feels very authentic. You know, if you've ever been someone who's had a panic attack, you you could see yourself a bit in that scene. Um, yeah. What, what, what did you want to say about, you know, mental illness, things like that? Yeah, well, I think both through Todd and Rory, they're both characters who, who see themselves as unlovable in some way and um, are really like searching for, for connection and because they both bring their own baggage to the table. I think one of the things that makes their friendship so beautiful is, is the safety that they find in each other. And um, like, that's one thing I really loved about, uh, we, we see them take care of each other at various points. So, you know, when Rory has the panic attack, when they, when they try to physically consummate, we see Todd really try to be there for her physically and emotionally. And then respectively, when she breaks up with him and she sees him like um, totally um, break down and, and start to panic, um, she's able to, to be there and be present with him and say the things that he needs to hear um, until he can ground himself. And 
I think that just sort of speaks to the the mutual respect and understanding that they have with each other. And I guess I was just interested in exploring that, um, you know, because I think sometimes people with whatever um, uh, neurological difference they might have from, or neurotypical, you know, uh, might think that people won't be able to handle it um, or like that they're too much. And I guess I wanted to show a relationship where it's not too much. And it's, um, it's just about finding the people who are, have, who are equipped and have the empathy and, um, and, and care for one another to um, the, t I guess the tenderness to, to really um, to be there. Um, so we had a question come in from Erin on Instagram, and she wants to know, do you have any favorite romantic comedies? Yeah, uh, well, there were a few, like, references for, for straight up in terms of the rom-com genre. I, I think most similarly, just in terms of, like, themes, would be Kissing Jessica Stein or The Wedding Banquet or As Good As It Gets. Uh, I think Silver Linings Playbook and 500 Days of Summer are two of my all-time favorite rom-com so they're definitely like uh references for me um and then going you know like bringing up baby such a classic and totally you know uh with the, the banter and the, the screwball nature um was also an, another good reference for us and um on top of like moving aside from romantic comedies what were, were some of your other influences on this i was reading um a piece with you and you mentioned Koganada's Columbus, which I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to learn more about how that influenced the film. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, you know, I was actually reading a little bit more about, I forget what the, the word is, um, but it's sort of like the, uh, I'm not gonna say it because I'm gonna sound like a, a dumb butt and I'm gonna say it wrong. Also, no, I have 8% left. I just got worried that my, my computer was about to die. Um, yeah, there's, I think, a stillness uh, to it. It's like, into, it's an intellectual film, but it's also so heartfelt that it doesn't get overpowered by how smart it is. And, um, you know, I think there's a, a, a specificity and, and care to the, the composition. So it was mostly a visual reference for us, um, not just in terms of cinematography, but even like, I guess, like, I felt like the wardrobe was like, congruent with with the, the film and um color palette wise i mean our color palette's different it's a little bit more um uh retro and um what's the word uh rainbow-esque <laughs> so yeah uh but that's yeah we both greg at my dpa uh, we both really love that film um but in terms of other influences mm, yeah, you know, I, I it's hard for me to know because I, I sort of like uh, sponge up things that I like from everything. Mm -hmm. So I can just say that, you know, my favorite show of all time is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, so I'm a, you know, a big weed knight. And uh, I think he's another person who I would consider a genre blender. And I think I tend to gravitate towards that type of work and I, I consider straight up a, a genre blend. And um, you mentioned the cinematography. What made you want to shoot in 133? Is that something that you visualize from the get-go? Because I, I don't, I can't think of the last romantic comedy I saw that shot in that aspect ratio. I, I mainly think of like the lighthouse and kind of right. horror-esque stuff um, as yeah. of recently. We definitely, I, it's, it's making a comeback, especially in art house dramas. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that's where it feels a little bit more unusual, but you know, it used to be the, the, the standard, like bringing a baby, uh, his girl Friday, Moonlighting and Gilmore Girls were both originally broadcast in four by three because it was the TV ratio as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, um, it, it lent itself in a lot of ways on thematically, it feels like, you know, Todd and Rory, like, are sort of living in a box and they don't fit the contemporary ideal. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, also being an homage to like the old classical Hollywood. And I think um, Todd and Rory in a lot of ways have a sort of uh, old school Hollywood romance 
um, vibe. Uh, and just aesthetically, it also sort of lent itself to the symmetry and the composition that we wanted. So it checked off several, for lack of better pun, boxes um, that we were looking to, to, to check. Um, Tyler on Twitter would like to know, how long was the script versus the length of the film since the dialogue is so heavy and so fast? It's not too crazy, actually. Uh, the script is uh, 110 or 111 pages and the film's running time is, is 95. So the first draft of the script was 150 pages. <laughs> So that's and um, was not did, sustainable. Did you have any different cuts? How did editing play a role in, in the kind of the snappiness of the film? Uh, I think it was just a, you know fine tuning. Um, every scene that we shot made the film, except for we reshot the breakup scene because um, uh, the original one was a bit too heavy, and we wanted to you know make sure that it felt like it was still part of the fabric of the film. But yeah, uh, it was, um, you know, for all the things that can go wrong in, in shooting a low budget indie um, thing, it was a pretty smooth shoot overall. And um, as a first time filmmaker, um, what was the experience like after the film? I know you, you uh, the film won Breakthrough Centerpiece at Outfest. Outfest. Um, how did that feel in that last year? Oh, that was great. Um, it, was, it was particularly one wonderful because we shot in LA and our you know family and friends are here in LA um, I mean not my personal family but I, I did have my godmother fly out to come uh, so it was just great to be able to share it with everybody and you know we had a sold out screening and um, uh, it was really wonderful yeah cool. um, we have a question from Mike asking about what it was like to work with Betsy Brandt and Randall Park mm -hmm. um, uh, they're both fantastic. Uh, I can't say enough nice things about. You know, what's funny is that Randall, who primarily does comedies, uh, and and Betsy does comedies well, but I feel like most people know her for, for Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. um, she, it, they kind of mirrored our person, like both Katie and I personalities on set because Katie and, and Betsy are both really comedic showboats in terms of their personality in the best way possible. Like they're always cracking jokes and making the crew feel very comfortable and laughing. And I think Randall and I are people who are capable of humor, but we're a little bit more on the reserved side. Um, so it's just kind of funny, like the sort of, I don't know, character gender mirroring. And also we wore similar colors in our, our wardrobe, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess stemming off of that, um, what was it like to work with Tracy Toms? It was such a delight to see her pop up. I'm Death Love Proof's her. one of my favorite films. I've seen her perform live. She is. She's great. So it was, it was really nice to see her. Yeah, Tracy, I had actually imagined her for that role because I started writing this script back in 2013. And even when I was doing the proof of concept, because another actor played Todd in, in the short film, um, I remember texting him like, what do you think about Tracy Toms for, for the therapist? Um, so it was really like a little bit surreal, like working with her because uh, yeah, I'm a fan and um, you know, you don't always, uh, uh, the person that like you think in your head and then they're there in real life and then they're saying your words out loud. It's, it's pretty nifty. Um, Ethan would like to know what um, advice you have for first time filmmakers uh, who are trying to make their first film. Mm -hmm. um, I am <laughs> like so worried that um, this is going to die. Can I like, um, yeah, run absolutely. And get a, okay, absolutely. I promise I will be back in like 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just a reminder, if anyone is joining us right now, uh, feel free to submit questions on uh, YouTube. Uh, you can submit them through social media, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Um, I am doing a Q&A right now. If you're just joining us, uh, James Sweeney went to grab his uh, charger uh, just so we don't lose him before the Q&A is over. Um, but if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, shoot them over. And just a reminder that Straight Up is currently playing in the Coolidge Virtual Screening Room. Um, every viewing supports the Coolidge. Um, you can also go to coolidge.org and support us through membership and donations.
Okay, there we go. I'm back. Um, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> no worries. What was the question? Um, advice for first time filmmakers. Oh, gosh. Uh, that's such a hard question for me because I feel like my my path to making this film was so specific. It, it depends on what you want to do. Like, are you a writer? Are you a director? Are you both? Are you also trying to be an actor? Uh, but I guess in terms of the most general advice I can give, it's um, I feel like the people who get to make their movies are the people who just stick around longest. The people who don't give up um, seem to be the people who, who tend to keep working and to surround yourself with people who really believe in you and um, are there to support you and, and champion you. And um, that's really hard to find. So when you find somebody that you work well with, hold on to them and build each other up um, because you're both in this, uh, hopefully for, for the long game. Um, if you have a specific question, I'd be happy to answer it beyond that. But otherwise, I don't want to lead you down a straight path. <laughs> um, Michelle would like to know um, about the uh, houses in the film, all the shooting locations. Uh, how did you find those? Yeah, uh, it was a bit of a mix. We shot like during principal photography, which was 18 days, and I think we had 20 locations. So, you know, that was probably one of the biggest challenges of, of making this movie was the amount of locations and finding them with, because uh, we were working with extremely limited resources, trying to find locations that were as close to our aesthetic as possible so that they would require minimal set dressing. We had a fantastic production designer, but you know, we just wanted to not kill him. Uh, so we found um, most of them, I would say through either Gigster or Airbnb, or there was another one. I don't remember if it's called Rapall or there's an, another site that we use. It might not even be around anymore. Um, and then a couple of them through, uh, one of them uh, was a, a family friend. Um, and uh, yeah, so just asking around, um, not the houses, but uh, some of the other locations we found just through cold calling, like the bar and um, the cafe, it's in Eagle Rock, it's called Cindy's, um, you know, just find a place that would work with our shooting schedule and um, be reasonably priced. And um, yeah, so just, I guess, uh, re resourcefulness. Um, so when I was watching the film, there was a point during the film where I was laughing, but then I had a, a brief thought where I was like, I wish I was in a theater right now, surrounded mm -hmm. by people who are also laughing. Um, because comedies and, and just films in general really benefit from the theatrical experience. So what has it been like, I guess, A, navigating the film's release during all of this, and B, not being able to go to movie theaters and experience that joy that all of our us film lovers love to experience. Yeah, I mean, I have to say in that regard, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate because we had a pretty robust film festival run. So we premiered um, in San Francisco at the Castro Theater, which is this huge 1400 seat, like huge theater with the best audience. Like they're like laughing so hard that they're like clapping. And so like that experience is like irreplaceable and like is forever cemented as like one of the best days of my life. But then I also got to go like to a dozen different cities like from Milwaukee to New York to Tampa to um, Wichita uh, where we got to see a, a variety of different types of audiences react and people always laugh at different things. So I definitely got like the experience of seeing it. I only watched it like three of those times because I can't stand watching the movie. <laughs> But um, I would come in at the end and see how hard they laugh at the Helen Keller line because that tends to be the biggest. A great line, line man. <laughs> a great line. Um, and so that's where I'm like, oh, okay, I know this is a good audience. Um, uh, but or Palm Springs, that was another great, great festival. Um, but in terms of our theatrical, we were only two weeks into our theatrical. Uh, we opened at the IFC in New York and then at the AMC in LA, and then I think there was like one theater in Florida, and then psh, everything shut down. Um, but this has been really cool to, you know, be partnering with all these local cinemas throughout the nation and, um, you know, trying to help keep 
uh, indie uh, theater is alive because you know that's a huge part of my personal like it's my favorite thing to do just to go to the movies and you know watch a great film and just know that I can't look at my phone for the next 90 to 120 minutes and um just be and you know consumed in the story um so uh yeah uh it's uh you know I think we always knew that this film would reach its widest audience through digital just due to the nature of it being a, a low budget film that's yeah. um you know, be a, a slow, a slow rollout. Um, so Riley on Instagram would like to know if you are currently working on anything else during quarantine. And he says, hopefully another rom-com because straight up was really great. Oh, uh, I am working on a dark comedy about twins. There's, there's, it's not a rom-com, but there's some similar DNA. I definitely do love the genre. Uh, and there may be a rom-com in my future, but I'm a, also a bit genre agnostic. So I hope to play in a few different pools and, um, you know, everything will still be very me, but it won't always be quite as um, fast talking. <laughs> so uh, Band of Scrolls reached out and says, straight up explores mental illness and trauma. How did you approach depicting Rory's episode of being triggered and Todd's panic attack? And did you have doubts about doing so within a comedy? Yeah, I, doubts are, that, that's a fair word. You know, I think we both, Katie and I, were, were committed to portraying um, both Rory's trauma and, and Todd's ongoing battle with, with OCD and anxiety in a, in a truthful way. But I don't know, I feel like, like life, like even if you, have a hard life that doesn't mean there isn't laughter or, or joy or humor in it mm -hmm. um i think uh there's also you know we're preceded by a lot of great films that are able to explore serious topics but in a humorous way so i felt like i trusted that an audience wouldn't be you know too that we could do it in a way that was i think in some ways it actually makes it more palatable and accessible like when you can explore sexual trauma through a joke. Um, not that we're not, again, explicitly making fun of the trauma because the trauma isn't funny um, by itself, but you know, everything is through context and perspective. And yeah, I think uh, we just wanted to make people feel like they know that they're being taken care of, I guess. And you did make some very particular choices in relation to Rory's trauma in the film um, to the point where just seeing her lips move, you know, mm -hmm. on the other side of the shower door. Yeah. Told you everything you needed to know. Right. Um, how did you approach that? Well, it's not every, <laughs> some people miss it. Uh. <laughs> I've learned. Uh, I remember I was at a Q and A and somebody asked me um, when in the, in the uh, truth or dare Christmas scene where, um, Rory, kiss, uh, Meg kisses Rory, and then she goes in the bathroom and um, does some grounding techniques because she's panicking. And um, she didn't understand what was happening there and, and thought that maybe she was like turned on and maybe she was bisexual and attracted to Meg. And I'm like, well, I don't want to tell you as an audience what to interpret, but that's kind of wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, but everyone else in the audience understood that that wasn't the intention, of, but it was a bit of a funny moment. So I will say that you know, whereas Todd is somebody who is extremely textual and kind of says everything that's on his mind without any sense of regret or remorse. Um, Rory is somebody who is a little bit more internal. So mm -hmm. some of her character and her backstory is implied as opposed to explicitly portrayed. I think part of that was the fact that I think there, I wouldn't say a tendency, but I, I feel like a an irk I have with some fil film fi and the way they treat female characters is I feel like sometimes they're reduced to their trauma. Um, and I didn't want like Rory's whole character to be about what happened to her in the past. Yes, she's on a journey mm -hmm. of healing and I wanna portray that respectfully, um, but it's also a rom-com. And, you know, I just, I don't want that to define her because there's so many other more beautiful parts of her character than that. Um, so before we wrap this up, I, I didn't want to ask you, I went to your website and um, front and center, when you go to the homepage, there's a picture of a sign 
that says, attention, take note of what it feels like to be alive right now. And that really struck me. (laughs) And I was curious where that came from and what you had to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of like, I mean, I guess Todd and Rory would argue about whether that's actually ironic. Um, Yeah, that's uh, where I go hiking. And um, it's poignant, but it was a little bit like, because there was another one too it was a stop sign but it said start um and uh it, it was like I don't know who who put them there but I loved it and uh I guess that is I think I would consider myself a, a bit of an existential person um and uh yeah I guess um it resonated with me what was your question I'm sorry I just I just was curious wondered why where, where that... it came from it, it it struck me it felt like a a, a good yeah. message for right now Mm-hmm. Um, and I was curious just if it was because of right now or if it's just been up there. No, oh, no, it's that's been on my website for like six months at least. So <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious. But yeah, it's, it's always relevant. You should always take note of what it feels like to be alive. I agree. Um, well, thank you so much, James, uh, for joining yeah. us today. Um, if you haven't seen it straight up yet, watch it. It's in the Coolidge Virtual Screening Room. Support the Coolidge, uh, donate, watch our films. Um, and we hope to see all you guys soon. Thank you so much again, James. Um, yeah. And I so hope- thanks everyone for watching and um, supporting independent film. Cool.